Let's just do a couple minutes on who you are and what got you to that stage, and then we're going to dive into all the issues and talk about love and healing crystals and everything else. Oh, I thought. So take it away. <laughs> I didn't know that was a specific question. That's Marianne Williamson uh, getting interviewed by Dave Rubin on his show. And uh, it started a little rocky, as you can see there, but uh, it was actually a good interview. I, I personally enjoyed watching it. I thought that she had great answers. And this was one of the rare instances where Dave Rubin did what interviewers are supposed to do, uh, ask questions and have follow up questions, maybe even pushing back on things that you disagree with. Now, I wish that were true of other interviews he does, but what he has Individuals like Stefan Molyneux pushing his racist ideology on the program, no pushback at all. And I'll show you examples of that in just a second. But before I do so, I want to give you some of the snippets of this interview that I thought stood out. Now, let's go to the first video and I'll kind of fill in the blanks. You said something, when I knew I wanted to have you on the show was during the debate, you said something that I thought this is actually completely unheard of for a Democrat, at least in 2019, to say. You said, I do not believe that the average American is racist. No, I don't. And yet, it seems if you watch mainstream media, we are just caught in you're racist, you're racist, you're yeah. a bigot, you're a fascist, <laughs> you're a homophobe, you're a transphobe, this endless game, and unfortunately, and I say this as someone that was, you know, that I still consider myself liberal, but I'm, I'm a lifetime Democrat, really, mm -hmm. at least until the last two or so years. Um, a lot of that's coming out of the left and from the Democrats, this labeling of everyone as racist. Well, I hear you and you're leaving out a very important factor, which is that the president, at least based on his tweets and his comments, is. So I agree with you that uh, a smug, self-righteous, intolerant left-winger is no less dangerous to the emotional fabric of our country than a smug, self-righteous, intolerant right-winger. And some of the shutdown, you shut up, you didn't say the right thing, comes from the left as much as the right these days. I will give you that. And it's dangerous and it's wrong. However, this president says things and is involved in it right now, which by any, by any measure, are racist comments. I show you that clip because the whole brand that Dave Rubin is trying to put out there is that he hates identity politics. He hates talking about the racist issues. He like he just he wants to talk about the issues that matter. But all he does over and over again is talk about race. He's the one who talks about race over and over again, but he does so from the standpoint of there's no racism in America. Everything's great. This is just oppression Olympics. You want to know what real oppression is? I'm being censored on social media. That's real oppression. Now, there are algorithm changes on social media that have affected everyone, this company included, but it's amazing how he claims that Oh, there's too much attention on race relations in America, but I'm gonna dedicate 95% of my show on race relations in America. And he had her on specifically because he thought it was great that she said that she doesn't believe most Americans are racist. So it's amazing to me. Anyway, go ahead. This woman should not be president of the United States. It's offensive at this point. And it's harmful when you find yourself as a white person, essentially equating race to someone being shut down because they, racism to saying the wrong things, they are, those are not two of the same things. Mm -hmm. And words often cause actual violence. This belief, this anti people of color, anti immigrant, this anti Muslim rhetoric coming from the top is more than just someone saying the wrong thing. And when you find yourself as a white person, Talking about race and you start with the both sides things, you're thinking about, okay, that's where I'm gonna go with this, don't. Mm -hmm. Right. That's just right. it. And she should be smarter than that. Yeah, so right. Nita, before, you, before oh. you jump in, I actually wanna go to the next clip because okay. we have a lot of video to get to. And um, when we come back, I want you to comment on what happens in this next video. I don't even really know who's talking about policy anymore or, or really what I would rather talk about all day long, which is how much government is needed to do anything, yeah, which I think would be a rich I don't place know. to I have a discussion. I think it's more complicated than that. I think we need to walk and chew gum at the same time. So Dave Rubin argues that the left wing doesn't talk about policy, that we all we do <laughs> is talk about right, racism right, right, and race right. relations in America. Okay, uh, I have a plan for that. 
is literally like a motto in one of the Democratic candidates' presidential right. uh, you know, platforms. Elizabeth Warren, I have a plan for that. How We talk about policy nonstop, but in his bubble, in his world, the only thing that makes him money is to stoke racial tensions. I told, I said that you would be able to talk when we came back, I'm sorry. <laughs> Nathan, jump in. Um, no, it's, it's all good. I think what we're seeing here is that people don't understand that identity politics includes white nationalists, yeah. right? That is an identity and when you set white as as neutral default, it obfuscates the fact that it is part of the identity politics rhetoric. So they're doing it way more than the people that allegedly are constantly obsessed and trying to get you mind focused off of real material policies. But I will say that I think, you know, that. I don't know if that clip was so fair to what she goes into when she talks about race and racial and racial economic disparity that exists in the US because she does a Stunning deep dive that into reparations, shins. which was impressive. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I, so I wish we could show you longer clips, but um, I did not like the fact that she tried to draw this false equivalency right. between Absolutely. the right and the left. That was definitely a misstep, in my opinion. It did and people uh, yeah. calling out racism compared to people perpetuating exactly right. People, right. I, I, that, no, that. absolutely. And I think the problem is that it's damaging. Yeah, it's dangerous. I, I think that. Sometimes what white folks think they can do to enter a conversation is acquiesce the initial claim Mm -hmm. to delve deeper. And I think that's what her strategy was. And I'm not saying I'm I'm cool with that strategy, Mm -hmm. but it was it was more interesting when you got further into the discussion, which does not defend her initial comments. Um, I will say, you know, to be transparent, she has Monday sermons in LA. She's had them for decades, and I've been to them. And I've oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. We can have a, maybe a post game show about he that. He was very, he was very upset about those sermons because apparently she tries to get uh, you know black right. and white individuals to connect on a deeper level, and he thinks that she does that out of white guilt. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And the the fact that, and again, he goes into we shouldn't be responsible. I don't know if you have more clips around some of this stuff, but it got really interesting around the Holocaust and how she pushed back on him. Mm-hmm. With his unacknowledging the harm that slavery, the genocide that went with slavery, the genocide of Native Americans, for him, he thought that the Holocaust, he was playing Oppression Olympics. Again, it was, again. It was mm-hmm. Oppression Olympics. And I, I thought that was one of her stronger moments in the interview where he asks her, Do you really think that slavery was as bad as the Holocaust right. was? And she said, No one has a monopoly. Right on, you know, yeah. on on pain, right. and so she said, absolutely, it, it was right. terrible. Um, I'm paraphrasing, right? But um, she even asked him, "Have you have you read up on slavery in America?" <laughs> yeah, he's like, "Yeah, yeah, I have." Um, right. I don't know if she did this show. Well, yeah, I know, I know. I'm actually, I, I would typically say I'm against it, but I think she handled it well. If you watch the entirety right, of the right, interview, right. you'll get mm-hmm. what I'm saying. Um, because she did not back down. There yes. were moments where he pushed back, and you're about to see it right now, and she wouldn't back down. And I thought that that was actually um, impressive. So let's go to the next clip. This is one of the examples where uh, he pushes back. There's all this underlying racial tension in this country. It's not spoken. It's resentment. It's it's almost like now in my lifetime, I've certainly seen the ways in which racial issues have gotten better. But at the same time, you see how certain things are unwinding, almost getting worse. And so we we need an integrated- Yeah, that really feels right to you. That feels like a media makeup to me. I I don't think racism, that's why I was so thrilled when I heard you make that statement. I don't think most Americans are racist. I don't think most Americans are racist, but I don't, that's not my experience and it's not my belief. But what is my belief is that the average American is woefully undereducated about the history of race in the United States. Including Dave Rubin, and she was asked to provide examples of systemic racism, and she did. She cited various studies showing how the justice system is there's a difference in sentencing when it comes to black and white individuals. When it comes to the use of drugs, black individuals, white people are you know take drugs or use drugs at the same rate. But when you look at prosecution, the black community is prosecuted much more aggressively. So she gives all of these examples. And of course, it does nothing to persuade Ruben because he's playing into the type of audience that loves the rejection of what's really happening in the country. And so I bring this up because one of the biggest 
criticisms that Ruben deals with and it's a legitimate criticism. And it's one of the reasons why I think it's a bad idea for candidates to go on his show is because he's had some of the worst people on that program and he does not push back. And his whole argument was, well, here's the thing, I don't wanna debate people, mm -hmm. right? I want them to feel comfortable sharing their perspectives and their viewpoints and I'm not there to make them uncomfortable or to fight back or debate them. And he did that throughout the interview with Marianne Williamson. He did not do that when he had Stefan Molyneux on. And this guy is just repulsive. I'll give you an example right now, let's take a look. There's not a lot of famous Jewish architects or engineers because Jews test an average around the hundreds in, in spatial reasoning. Mm -hmm. But crazy high on verbal acuity, verbal reasoning. So of course you would expect uh, among novelists, among playwrights, among lawyers, where high verbal IQ is very important, gonna find a lot of Ashkenazi Jews. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, you do. So what that means is that let's say Ashkenazi Jews sort of 120, 125 verbal IQ, and there's a certain proportion of them in the language field, but it's not anything to do with Judaism, it's to do with IQ. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that if you look at any group of people wherein they're in that IQ, they're gonna be equally represented or proportioned. And then under that you have, I don't know, the word Orientals kind of come out of favor, which is kind of annoying in a way because how do you differentiate people from India, people from sort of East Asians, whatever, the Chinese, Japanese, and so on. Uh, 103, 104, 105 uh, IQ in general, very high on uh, spatial reasoning, mm -hmm. which is why, you know, the software engineers, uh, other kinds of engineers, you see that, you know, like Google has this like, it's like 40% or something like that of, of their engineers are Not East much Asian. more because after this diversity thing goes through, yeah. they're gonna just have to pick everybody by color and all that nonsense. But, but this is the thing, right? So if you're looking at East Asians with very high spatial IQ, they're gonna be quote, overrepresented in those engineering fields and so on, but, not because everyone who's got that IQ is up there, there just happen to be more of those, right? Mm -hmm. So there's uh, Stefan Molyneux uh, trying to make the argument that different races have different IQs and uh, certain races are smarter than others, just perpetuating this nonsense. And what did you, did you hear Ruben push back on that at all? Did he do any research to, to you know, or was there even a follow up? All he oh. did was agree, and by the way, it's about to get worse because I have another clip on this. He just doesn't push back at all. So when you have someone from the left on, first of all, he rarely does, but let's say you do, right? And it's no surprise that he's willing to do that when they're presidential candidates. Why is it okay to push back, but it's not okay to do it when you have a disgusting, repulsive little words I can't say on this show right now on your show. But because when you don't consider words like what he just said, when you don't consider that racist, mm -hmm. then you believe like Marianne said that most Americans are not racist because when you define racism as like a Klan member in full hood uniform, burning a cross in front of an old black lady's lawn and saying the N word no less than 17 times. Yeah. And that's the only way you can be racist. Then yeah, sure. Most Americans are not. Not right. a lot of racism right, right. at all. And so that's how that's how come he didn't push back on that because he doesn't find that to be a problem. Well, that's why it is a, like we've been talking about. It's been an identity politics um, rhetoric that they've been using because if you would actually look at structures, you can connect the idea of race as not just the explicit interpersonal stuff that is horrifying and horrific, mm. but you can make the connection to what Marianne Williamson later talks about, which is the 250 years of slavery, the 100 years of, um, of institutional racism, the continued institutional racism that we see in criminalizing um, drugs with a massive disparity, the disparity between property um, levels that influence the quality of education yes. that different racial groups are getting, right? So if you can't make those connections, then you can't understand that if you are profiting from a system that is hurting people actively and has been for hundreds of years, then you are a racist if you're not fighting directly against it. And if you consider yourself an ally and someone who does fight against it, at what point is it your responsibility to not go on shows like this? At what mm. point is it your responsibility to not help make places like that make money? At right. what point is it your that. responsibility to not give you know more shine and share your gigantic platform with this man who says, who puts you in a corner 
and praises you for something that was, you, you misspoke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me be clear you about know? something. Yeah. So I, I totally agree, that is such a good point because when legitimate people go on shows like this, it helps them launder their racism and launder their image. And I think that that's incredibly destructive because it legitimizes them. Right. Yeah. And you're seeing this happen with a lot of the Trump era uh, repulsive people, Lauren Southern is an example. She's like, oh, I think I need to take a break. I'm gonna take a break. I don't know what I'm gonna do next, but she's gonna go away for a little while, mm -hmm. right? Possibly launder her image mm -hmm. and come back and maybe she's had a, an awakening because the grift isn't working anymore. Right. People yeah, right, are right. becoming more aware. Gavin McInnes is another example who offered me $11,000 to go on his, sh his show. And I said, no, I'm not gonna go legitimize this crackpot show. I have no interest in that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then he did the same thing with uh, David Pakman and even called into David Pakman's show pretending like he was someone else, a liberal who wa wanted to like encourage Pakman to like watch the Gavin McInnes show and possibly go on, whatever it is. These people are trying to change their image because the grifting isn't working right. anymore. Yeah. And so I totally agree with yeah. you in that People who are legitimate and, and care about doing the right thing should just take a quick moment to think about the destructive nature of these programs and what they're doing to, maybe unwittingly doing to legitimize them. Your actions have to be stronger than your words though. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I'm not saying people can't make mistakes. I'm not, this is not specifically just about her going on this show, but your actions have to be stronger than your words. And what going on shows like that, whether you're trying to sell a book, whether you're trying to gain popularity for your vanity presidential run, but it says that my popularity, what I can gain from this and these people who support this are more important than the people that this rhetoric harms. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and, and it's it especially yeah. if your message is that there needs to be a spiritual and moral awakening right, in this country. Right, that's an easy decision. Right. No, right. I'm not yeah. doing yeah. that, it should be easy. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, her whole, that's her whole message. And so when people say it's fake, I mean. And mm. one final thing, and I know we've gone too long with this, but I have to show you the last video okay. and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, the final part of Stefan Molyneux and, and the lack of pushback that we see from Dave. Blacks make less money than Ashkenazi Jews. But if you normalize by IQ, they don't. And this is, again, it's heartbreaking stuff and it is so difficult to absorb this into your daily thinking. Because, so, but, but sorry, I, go ahead. Yeah, well, I just wanna pause you for a second because it's interesting you're describing it as heartbreaking and struggle because that's what I was gonna ask you is that because you do talk about this stuff, um, I was gonna ask you, are you troubled by it? Oh, and it's because I don't know that I've gotten that exactly yeah. through your videos, but I obviously haven't seen everything that yeah. you've done on this. So hearing you frame it in that way is actually different than the, a bit of the impression I had of you on this. Oh, do you know how much I would give Dave to, to know that it was just racism? So there's Dave Rubin helping to launder the racism and the bigotry of Stefan Molyneux, right? right. So. It goes back to what we were saying earlier. Yeah, and so the, the thing that I will give Marianne Williamson credit for doing on the Dave Rubin show is backing up everything she was saying with historical examples. This guy gives zero historical examples and out of context. The IQ test, standardized intelligence test, that started in 1882 by this guy Francis Galton, who is a eugenicist. So everything that we understand of this test and what it's supposed to tell us is rooted in racism. And there is no, there's no challenging anything of, his, of, of that and no asking him to put it in historical context at all. So again, he's letting him off easy and letting the racism run buck wild. Two easy ways to follow Young Turks. One is hit the subscribe button down below, uh, then you're a TYT subscriber. And second is ring the bell. And when you do that on YouTube, you're notified of our videos.